Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Andrew Jakes, a wildlife biologist with the National Wildlife Federation, will be speaking about pronghorn, a focal species for grasslands connectivity. Just a little bit of business before we begin. PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Our next webinar will be January 29th, and it's about piping plovers by Shirley Bartz with Nature Saskatchewan. You can check out the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, for information about upcoming and past presentations. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Eco-Friendly Sask, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, SAS Power, and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the National Wildlife Federation. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the, the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Andrew Jakes is the Regional Wildlife Biologist for National Wildlife Federation based out of Missoula, Montana. He received his Bachelor's of Science from James Madison University in Virginia and his Master's of Science at Towson University in Maryland, where he studied beaver habitat selection at the Savannah River Ecology Lab in South Carolina. He then moved out west and worked several years for federal and state agencies on a variety of species and systems until starting his PhD on pronghorn movement ecology at the University of Calgary in Alberta, which he completed in 2015. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Montana from 2015 to 2017, using multiple species approaches to study the effects of fencing on wildlife movement and habitat selection. He seeks to use science to guide implementation of on-the-ground efforts for wildlife. Andrew enjoys hiking and camping hunting, playing the guitar, and laughing with his family and friends. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Andrew. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Caitlin. I really appreciate it. Um, hoping everyone can hear me. Um, good morning. Um, it's great to be online with all of you up in Canada. I wish I was up there a bit. Um, so. Anyway, I wanted to provide this webinar um, and give information uh, for both for everyone, um, whether you're an academic or a habitat or wildlife manager um, or work for an NGO or you're um, a private citizen or a private landowner. I hope that uh, at the end of the webinar, you'll, you'll get something out of my talk. Um, this talk really is an expansion of um, uh, a talk that I provided at the Prairie Conservation Forum um, in October. So it may be, there might be parts that are redundant for some of you, um, but uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy it. I tend to have way too many slides, um, so I'm going to be kind of going through these quite quickly. Um, and so look forward to any questions that you might have at, at the end. Um, so with that, I tend to provide an outline and you'll see this image again as I get to each of the different pieces, but it's just kind of a way for um, us all to take a breath and say, okay, on to the next uh, component. So anyway, I'm gonna start with a little bit of um, uh, theory. Um, so let's start with, with connectivity. Let's start with some, some definitions. Um, so basically connectivity is the degree to which landscapes facilitate or impede movement. And there's two components to connectivity. There's the structural, um, which means basically the physical relationships between habitat patches, and the functional, which is the degree to which landscapes actually facilitate or impede movements of organisms, individuals, or ecological processes. So when we talk about structure, we're talking things about width, length, um, but when we're talking about functional, we're talking about sustaining populations. Um, 
And the other definition I'd like to throw out there is corridor. It's a distinct component of the landscape that provides connectivity. Um, <clears throat> so there are many benefits to wildlife um, by providing connectivity. I'm not going to go through all of these, but really what you can see is that it helps to retain um, a resilient and functional ecosystem through increasing habitat, species richness and species uh, diversity. Uh, diversity. Certainly there are potential possible, possible negative effects to connectivity, um, but, but in reality, the, the benefits far outweigh um, the, the negative components. And when we're talking about connectivity, the, the goal is to design these connectivity networks, um, which is um, you know, managing both of wildlife and habitat. So what we're trying to do is finding a balanced approach where we're conserving for biodiversity, but also sustaining the use of natural resources. And these connect connectivity networks are based on a spatial configuration. Here, what I show with this, with this fairly general schematic is the four components um, uh, to a landscape. We have the background matrix in yellow. We have the habitat patch that we're interested in in dark green with its buffer in light green, and then the corridors that, that connect all these different habitat patches, patches. And you can imagine that if this configuration was linear, that you would have a lot less connections or corridors between these patches. And so spatial configuration when you're designing these is quite important. Now there's um, various types of wildlife movements that are facilitated by corridors. Certainly we have our daily movements, but there's also seasonal movements as well that can be uh, longer distance. Those are things such as migration, dispersal, and then movement in response to extreme or changing conditions. And that, that can be things such as snowfall or floods, um, an acute anthropogenic disturbance, or uh, the all-encompassing climate change. And if we look at one of those specific types of movements um, is migration. Migration is an adaptive strategy to exploit resources based on both internal and external control factors. And when we talk about those types of the control factors, if we're thinking internal, we're thinking things about behavioral, demography, meaning sex or age, um, and genetic imprinting. Whereas we're thinking about external control factors, those are things such as environmental cues or ecological requirements. So migration occurs across taxa, across species, and it's defined as undistracted movements interspersed with stopover sites. And the ability to migrate certainly influences both reproductive and survival rates um, across seasons. Now, one um, specific definition is partial migration, and that's observed at the population level. And so what partial mig migration is, is, is where there's a certain percentage of individuals in the population that migrate and a certain percentage um, stay residential in the same seasonal range year round. Now, individuals um, can switch, um, that's, that's a plastic uh, tactic, but overall we can kind of look at both um, migratory and residential animals in a partial, uh, migra uh, partially uh, migratory population. And long distance migrations in general are declining in ungulates uh, world rot, worldwide that was first proposed um, by uh, Berger in 2004. And so let's move on to Antelope capro americana, um, the pronghorn. Um, it's an endemic uh, species to North America. It is unique, um, the only uh, extant uh, species in its uh, taxonomic family certainly known for its, um, for its sight, um, its speed, um, and as I mentioned, is very, very unique. Its closest relative is actually the giraffe. Um, so you can kind of see the similarities there. Um, some things about uh, the life history and, and management of pronghorn. Uh, it was proposed that there's uh, anywhere from 30 to 60 million pronghorn across North America historically, um, but because of overhunting, um, that, that number was decimated by 1923. I think they estimated 13,000 across the landscape um, with the help of, of, of provincial and state and federal agencies, as well as private landowners. That number was bumped up to um, 1.1 million in 1999. 
Currently, uh, across its range, we're about 915,000 uh, individuals. And uh, something to point out that uh, where we're talking about, where, where we've done our work, is at the northern periphery of Pronghorn Range, uh, meaning the prairies of, of Alberta and Saskatchewan and then northern Montana. And the Pronghorn Range uh, heads south all the way to the northern uh, uh, states of Mexico. What I've shown here on the left is the, the longest um, movement, annual movement recorded for a pronghorn. Uh, this was uh, ear tag three. She was uh, captured on the Alberta uh, Montana border uh, back in 2004. And uh, if you follow her pathway, she heads up through Medicine Hat or just east of Medicine Hat and heads all the way up to about Unity, Saskatchewan, where she summered. And then back, uh, she headed back down south during the fall and her collar dropped on CFB Suffield. Um, that year. So that is the longest recorded um, migration for, for the species. Um, and of course, pronghorn depend on open landscapes. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, of grasslands and the changing face of grasslands. And certainly over time, there's been cumulative economic pressures that are incrementally increasing across the landscape. Um, and anthropogenic changes reduce the capacity of native landscapes to support um, wildlife. And so what we need as wildlife and land managers are tools that balance the economic needs and pressures with wildlife requirements, because we all need a seat um, at the table. And so to mitigate some of these cumulative impacts, one option is to maintain connectivity throughout the system. And again, as we talk about connectivity, we're thinking more about what it means towards populations or that functional connectivity. Again, just to remind everyone, and that's the degree to which landscapes sustain movements within and among a mosaic of habitat types. So I want to uh, give some background um, and talk a little bit about my work um, at the University of Calgary. That's the next piece. Um, so the purpose of my PhD project, um, it's long-winded, <clears throat> was to develop a hierarchically scaled modeling approach to predict pronghorn migrations for designing connectivity networks across the northern edge of uh, pronghorn range. And so what really does that mean? Well, there's certain attributes across a system and at different and at various scales that that wildlife select for or against. And they may be similar or they could be different based on the, the scale of what you're looking at. And so here I've provided um, these different levels of, of scales of selection. So if you start at the left-hand side, that's the first order of scale of selection. So for pronghorn, what attributes are they selecting for or against which put them in the northern sagebrush step as opposed to the rest of the general pronghorn range? And then if you zoom into the northern sagebrush step, what attributes are they selecting for or against along a, a, a migratory pathway? Um, uh, and that's the second order of selection. What, what are they selecting for um, for a migratory pathway? And then if you zoom into this entire uh, migratory pathway, what attributes are they selecting for or against along steps along the pathway? That's that finer third order scale. And then at the finest scale, it's this fourth order of selection. What attributes are they selecting within that, that you know, two or four hour relocation period? So my work focused on these second and third order uh, scales of selection. And so how did we predict where animals were migrating through the Northern Sage Rush Death? Well, we did that with empirical data. Um, that we collected through uh, uh, GPS collars. They were deployed on female pronghorn over a span of six years. 75 were um, deployed on female pronghorn in Alberta and another 110 across Montana and Saskatchewan. And so this is what, um, you know, collaborators have termed the Northern Sagebrush Steppe. It's quite large. It's about the size of the state of New Mexico. It's approximately 315,000 square kilometers. And again, um, you can see that it's a matrix of, of land use. In green, we have um, native grasslands. Um, in yellow, we have native sagebrush. Um, and in orange, or sorry, in brown, we have dryland agriculture. 
And there's the various other land cover types in there as well. But you can see that it's a, you know, patches, um, a matrix of different land cover use. And then if we put the migratory um, <clears throat> data from pronghorn from the study on top of that, you can see that it's fairly widely distributed across the northern sagebrush steppe, which is good for when we're predicting um, uh, pronghorn use um, during spring and fall migrations. So the first thing we wanted to do was, was really to analytically identify some of these differences of movement tactics. And what I mean by that is, how do we classify a migrant from a resident? And so on the top component, um, you have these two figures. On the x-axis, um, you have numbers of days from captured. So animals are typically captured on winter range, which would be day zero. And then on the y-axis, you have this net square displacement, which basically is a distance from that, that winter range. And so if you look at the, the left-hand figure, this is what a, a migrant typically looks like. Each one of these little circles denotes a day. And so you have an animal starting off on winter range and they make, she makes her spring migration up to a summer range where she sits there for you know, approximately 150 days, then makes her fall, fall migration back to uh, winter range. So that is an easy classification of, of a migrant individual. They're, they're certainly not typically that cut and dry, but this is a, a classic example. Um, on the right hand side, we have what a resident looks like. So you can see that there's a lot of overlap um, between days. It basically stays on the same seasonal range year round. Um, so then secondarily, we wanted to assess um, if we could identify stopover sites along the migratory pathway. And we were able to do that by quantifying some, um, some movement rate, rates and movement turn angles. And I'm not going to get too much into stopover sites on this talk, but just wanted to show that we did do that as well. Um, for you science folks, wanted to show these next couple of slides. Wanted to really present how we did that, that sampling uh, scheme um, in a hierarchical multi-scale approach. So as we're looking at third order selection, what we have here, the dots in yellow, are those are the third order case points, or the they're those um, relocation points. And then at a five to one ratio, we have control points associated with each one of those case points. So again, it's a five to one ratio um, along each step of the path of the pathway. So that's third order sam uh, sampling uh, scheme. And then to go up to a second order level, we use those third order control points now as our second order case points. So they are identical. Um, and then we look at those, um, what attributes are associated with those second order case points relative to all these various control points across the entire Northern Sagebrush step. And those ratios were uh, one to one. Um, so it's uh, it's the same data, but it's used independently from one another. So that's how it's hierarchically nested. Just wanted to show that these are the various parameters that go into the logistic modeling. Um, there's both environmental and anthropogenic variables. And on top of that, there's both spatial and temporal parameters. Um, for an example, NDVI is a measure of forage quality and we were able to assess its impact or influence on, uh, on pronghorn migration. And through the magic of modeling, I'm just gonna cut right to results. And, and I just wanna say that um, I'll be providing results for spring migration only from here on out, but we have a, a second set of fall migration results. Um, so um, I don't have time to go into all of those. So basically here are the third order results across the Northern Sagebrush Steppe. Um, the, the areas in reds have high um, probability of use for spring migratory, um, as spring migratory habitat. The areas in blue have low probability of use um, as spring migratory habitat. So that's at the third order. Here are the results from the second order. Um, again, areas in red have the highest probability of use, and areas in blue have the lowest probability of use. Um, there is, again, a number of variables that went into all, the, all these model, models, and here are some of the most important ones. Um, the fact that grassland was a, a positive attribute 
um, and roads was um, road density was a, a negative influence. Um, those are probably the two main uh, variables um, in, in all of these models. So with the um, magic of GIS, you can then multiply these two raster layers together and integrate into one final prediction. Um, so we call this our integrated step selection function map. You don't have to worry about that. There won't be a quiz at the end. But what you do need to you know, think is, is interesting is that it takes into account what animals are selecting for or against at the third order and at the second order and displays that into one final map, which we have here. So just in summary of, of what I've just presented, these maps account well for multi-scale selection of movement pathways. I'm not going to go into it, but we did a lot of validation of these models and they validated well. Again, I didn't talk about stopover sites, but they were selected in areas with high forage quality, north facing slopes and low, lower well densities. Um, and then we do show that pathway selection was hierarchically nested. Um, so pronghorn were highly influenced by anthropogenic features at that broad scale, but then much less at that, at that finer scale. So if they selected against it um, at that broader scale, even if there are still some features on the landscape, they could be close by at a, at a, at a finer scale. So then how is that important um, as we move forward with, with connectivity networks um, or designing a connectivity network? Again, just to, to provide some background, connectivity networks are these regional networks of habitat patches linked by functional corridors. So really what, what we just what I just created was a background cost surface, which I show here up at the top, for then what all the, the connectivity modeling, um, how, how we move forward with the connectivity model. So um, what I've shown here is the end version. So areas in, in blue have high resistance um, towards connectivity and areas in red have low resistance in connectivity modeling. Um, so what we're doing is trying to connect um, various habitat patches. We selected a, a habitat patch size of, of, of 200 square kilometers. That's based off of Mike Suter's work in Alberta um, back in 2011. And then, uh, uh, we identify connectivity not only between these large habitat patches, but also within them because they are such large areas of, of grassland. And then these least cost pathways were validated against relocation data. I just wanted to point that out. The other piece that you need to do besides a cost surface when doing connectivity modeling is identifying the corridor width. And so how we did that, uh, how we identified this optimal spring corridor width was we created a series of rasters of various widths, everywhere from the entire Northern Sagebrush step to down to 100 meters in, in width. And then what we looked at is the percentage of points um, within a percentage of area. And the optimal uh, corridor width was when we had the most amount of points within the smallest area. And so what we find when we do that is that five kilometers during the spring was the optimal corridor width. Now you can see that three kilometers, two kilometers, 10 kilometers was, was pretty close by. So this really gives some wiggle room to land managers, wildlife managers, and what corridor width they wanna use within their jurisdiction. Now putting all those pieces together um, through the magic of black box uh, connectivity modeling, you end up with something that looks like this, which all these, um, which all these corridors are five kilometers in width. Um, the prioritized corridors are those in purple and the ones with the, the lower priority are in yellow. And you can see that they um, connect these large habitat patches. And you can also see within these habitat patches that there's a, some dark green areas. And those are the, um, the more important areas within these habitat patches for maintaining connectivity. This is what it looks like without those uh, habitat patches um, provided. So you can really see that the most important area for, for maintaining connectivity across the Northern Sagebrush Step system is right at that intersection of, of Alberta, Saskatchewan and, and Montana. Now let's talk a little bit about what that means for, for opportunities for doing mitigation. So if we zoom up 
to um, Medicine Hat, Alberta. Here we've got three uh, individuals migrating from, from south to north during the spring. And you can see that they're moving and then they get held up along the Trans-Canada Highway for some time um, because there are barriers to movement. You have the associated highway, the fences, the railroad, all those different things. And then after they're able to navigate through, they continue on their migratory um, pathway um, up the summer range. Well, it actually shows, the connectivity model shows that it does a good job showing where the prioritized connections are. Um, and so we would consider this an appropriate place um, for doing conservation actions on the ground right now, um, is, this, is this Medicine Hat area or this area east of Medicine Hat. I want to provide an example down in Montana. This is the Bedoin National Wildlife Refuge and uh, a key linkage area and priority corridor, Beaver Creek corridor. Um, here is movement vectors in the left-hand figure of three individuals across three separate years. And you can see that they cross US Highway 2 within a half mile of one another. Now remember that these are during three separate years. So something is very going on that's very important in this area that that individuals want to move from north to south. You can also see that they use this uh, in, the, in the bottom right hand figure that they use this Beaver Creek area. So that would be um, an area to do mitigation efforts right now. And here I've highlighted them. So the conclusions from, from my PhD work is that you can't, there are analytical approaches to identifying pathways and stopover sites. Um, by developing this, this scale integrated uh, relative probability map. And then we developed some, some uh, approaches to mapping connectivity across this um, three jurisdiction area. Um, importantly, um, because we're at the northern periphery of the range, it connects both major patches, but also these satellite patches. And that might be important as we face um, changing climates into the future. And, and I'd finally like to say that connectivity networks can be used as a tool for conservation planning, um, balancing the needs of, of um, our culture, our economy with those of wildlife. And so you can use this approach for designing um, connectivity networks for other migratory species in the prairie, such as mule deer, uh, greater sage grouse, and, and maybe somewhere down the line bison. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to switch um, gears and, and start talking a little bit more about fences. You'll see that we talk a lot about fences over the next um, 15 minutes or so. So there's a lot of anthropogenic barriers to movement. We have roads, um, natural wells with their infrastructure, wind farms with their infrastructure, railroads, um, urban and urban development, um, even man-made lakes um, can act as barriers. Um, and we've shown some, some of these um, results of what happens with these anth anthropogenic uh, barriers. Um, here on the right-hand side, we have um, um, a huge mortality event associated with railroads. Um, on the left-hand side, we show where there's a bunch of pronghorn that were trying to move from south to north um, during the spring migration, but couldn't because of the, the flooded area of, of, the, uh, of the Missouri River. But one of the things specifically associated with, with pronghorn are what I'm going to show you here. So here's an individual on the left-hand side that's moving from, from north to south. She crosses U.S. Highway 2, and then she gets down to some feature and starts moving perpendicular to it for um, about a week before she's able to navigate and continue on her migration. Uh, similarly, we have an animal moving from uh, north to south. She hits uh, some kind of feature and is stuck there for a week. And uh, once she uh, finds her way through, she continues on her migration. And, and I went out to both these sites, and these were just your regular, typical four-strand barbed wire fences. Um, and what the issue was, was that um, there was a bunch of snow that had drifted in, and animals couldn't uh, move um, um, across that, that, that barrier. And so you can imagine this is, is one specific fence um, there could be impediments from hundreds and hundreds of fences. So let's talk about fencing. Um, so fencing is ubiquitous across North America. There has never been any modeling approaches to predict fences at a broad scale, um, um, predict fences, especially at a broad scale. Um, and wildlife and land managers need fence layers to target on the ground implementation efforts 
and researchers need fence layers to help model um, potential ecological and biological effects um, to wildlife. So what we set out to do was to actually model um, fence location and density at a regional scale. We wanted to use repeatable methods to that, but also perplex, uh, provide flexibility so we can model in other jurisdictions. So here we have 16 counties across northern Montana. This was our study site for this, for this project. We used the stratified random uh, sampling approach based on various land cover classifications to run these 3.2 kilometer transects along roadways. And these were all the transects that were run during the summer of uh, 2009, 10 years ago now. Um, and we had 700, over 700 transects run, which equated to over 2,300 kilometers of fences surveyed along roadways. Um, <clears throat> so the model was based off of publicly available data sets, but then also um, we talked to uh, local experts from from federal, um, state agencies, tribal agencies, um, NGOs, to really hone in on what, from a broad scale perspective, where, where fences were. And they were based on, on three major um, components. Land tenure, which included ownership size and adjacent land ownership. Land cover, so if you're in riparian area or grassland or ag, and then roads. And then we modeled these three separate, uh, these three components separately and then combined them at the end. And when we combined them at the end and validated them, this was our result. We end up with this, this heat map, which shows uh, areas of the highest fence density along the high line area of Montana and low fence density. So those high areas are areas in, in yellow um, and the low fence densities are areas in purple. And this is what it looks like if you blow up to a, uh, to a specific county. This is Phillips County in northern Montana. So we have fence locations on the, on the left-hand side and then fence densities on the right hand side. I did want to point out that this was a model, so it's no by no means perfect. Um, so what we felt comfortable with um, for recommending was that the fence location map could be used at that localized scale within um, native and mixed habitats for specific needs um, for managing things like flex, um, ungulate winter range and, and prioritized corridors. But the fence density map could be used at a broader scale to prioritize planning efforts and to maintain connectivity and, and can be used in predictive models. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more um, um, along, the, along my presentation here. So then, you know, as we started talking about fences, we really started looking into it and just really not, not much is known about the impacts of fences on wildlife, which got us saying, well, hey, let's write a paper about it and let's talk about fence ecology. Let's define it. Let's understand that there's potentially positive influences on wildlife and there's potentially negative influences on wildlife um, and really provide a roadmap for researchers down the way. So as we all know, fences um, really are used as, as, as um, boundaries between properties and they're really important for maintaining uh, livestock um, in specified pastures. Um, so that's the reason why we have fences on the landscape. Um, certainly, and we also have fences on the landscape um, because they provide safety features um, for, for, to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions um, between either livestock um, or, or wildlife. Um, so I just want to point out that there are, you know, fencing can be used as a tool for wildlife management. So here's one, um, uh, here's, here's one example of where fencing is, is positive. So it's used to funnel animals across a roadway. So this is um, down in Pinedale, Wyoming, where fencing is used to move both pronghorn and mule deer across Highway 191 uh, to reduce uh, vehicle collisions. Um, here's another opportunity or example where fencing is used as a tool. Um, so these are uh, peninsular pronghorn um, that were released um, into new habitat. And so they were fenced. So um, there would be a reduction in predators. Um, so when it comes to endangered species, uh, fencing can be used as a tool. And certainly it can be used at small scales to reduce human wildlife conflicts. Here's an, 
uh, I'm an example of, of haystacks being fenced so that mule deer, elk, what have you, don't get into um, this landowner's hay and, and um, create an issue. But the take home message here is that all of these occur at small scales, all these, these positive influences. Um, here's some positive effects too for wildlife. And the caveat here is what species are we talking about? So it could be positive effect for some species but not for other species. So here, the loggerhead shrike, it's a predatory songbird. Um, and what they do is they impale their prey on, on, on barbs or thorns. Um, and so here we have a grasshopper that's been impaled on the barb of a fence, um, which is basically a surrogate for, for, um, for thorny buffalo berries. So in this capacity, it helps the loggerhead shrike. Not so useful for the grasshopper. Um, here's a positive influence. Uh, for fences for perching ferruginous hawks. You can see all the relocation areas um, along this fence line of ferruginous hawks, um, and they use fence posts as perch sites um, to help in predation. So that's a positive effect for ferruginous hawks, probably a negative effect for their prey. And finally, here's another example from CFB Suffield of um, possibly the use of, of fence um, to kind of by uh, golden eagle uh, to help in um, predating upon this pronghorn. It perhaps moved this pronghorn into this fence so um, it could get at it. Or perhaps the pronghorn actually moved the golden eagle into the fence to, to get the golden eagle off, eagle off of off of it. So you know again, depending on the species, there's positive and negative effects of, of fencing on the landscape. But certainly there's a, a full share of uh, detrimental effects too. We all know about direct mortality. Um, there will be a lot of pictures here, but here's um, you know, like an elk getting caught <clears throat> um, in fence. And there seems to be a higher propensity of juveniles being stuck in, in fences and direct mortality associated with juveniles. Uh, these are just some numbers from a seminal work, um, Harrington and Conover in 2006. Um, which showed that you know 79% of, of, of all mule deer mortalities were juvenile, 58% of pronghorn mortalities were, were, ju were juvenile, and 80% of mortalities associated with fences of elk were juvenile. So um, yeah, juveniles have a really tough time interacting and navigating fences. And it's not just ungulates, it's, it's all wildlife type. And certainly we know about some of the strategies um, specifically for sage grouse to reduce um, wild uh, collisions with fences. Certainly fences act as a barrier as well. Um, and this is maybe even more important as it, um, as it influences access to quality forage. Um, this can be a really big issue specifically at the northern periphery of, of, of pronghorn range and, and grassland range. I go back to this figure that I had shown before. If you look at the right-hand side, this is in the middle of a really difficult um, winter. An animal was moving to try and access some, some forage, um, and it got, it got stuck for about a week um, by one fence before it was able to move on. So you can imagine how much impact that can have um, um, at a population level um, with uh, hundreds of fences out on the landscape. And certainly some pronghorn and, and other wildlife don't make it. This one obviously wasn't able to navigate this fence and um, you know, became overexposed and, and died. And you can see here from an image up in Alberta that 95% or more of these relocations of pronghorn were on one side uh, of a fence. This fence is certainly acting as a barrier to, to movement. And as such, it decreases access to quality forage. <laughs> There's also stress and in, in injuries associated with, with um, navigating uh, barbed wire fencing. Here you can see that a lot of, of skin is, is, is exposed, which can lead to infection and overexposure to the elements. Um, here we have a close-up of that on this pronghorn, a lot of scarring. It's an image of a buck up on CFB subfield. You can see just how open those wounds are and how exposed this animal is. And finally, we have the reverse mohawk. Um, so it, it does have, it is quite an issue specifically for 
pronghorn, but also for other wildlife. And I just kind of want to drive that point home with this, uh, with this video. Properly modified animals can get through fences, but sometimes they're really difficult. And that female could tell you. So, really, what can we do? And this is some of the more exciting stuff is, you know, let's find some win-win solutions for wildlife and for, for landowners. So um, we started a um, a series of trials on fence modifications to sustain wildlife movement. Um, and we use remote cameras to really do a, a, all these analyses. So this is long winded, but these are the objectives is to sustain uh, seasonal and daily movements and to evaluate uh, certain modifications to determine if they improve permeability um, for wildlife and also um, look at how they influence um, livestock passage. And finally, to assess if there is some habituation uh, of wildlife to using certain uh, fence modifications. Now, I put this other, I put this video in here because nine times out of ten, pronghorn typically uh, crawl underneath fencing. They're highly adapted to open landscapes, but every once in a while, they do get. Them. So I, I just want to show that that yes, pronghorn can jump over fencing, but they don't like to. They typically crawl underneath fencing. So to set up this, this, this uh, experimental design, we had a couple of different uh, study areas, the CFP subfield in Alberta and the Matador Ranch owned by the Nature Conservancy down in Montana. And we used remote cameras and we used this, this study uh, site approach where we had no crossing um, sites. And then we also had uh, control cameras put up just adjacent to these known crossing sites, as well as treatment cameras put up. Um, and these treatment cameras looked at the influence of three different modifications. Um, in this trial, we had PVC pipe on the lowest bar, which we called goat bars. We replaced barbed wire with smooth wire, and then we lifted the bottom wire up to the second the bottom wire with um, a carabiner or a clip. And so this is basically what these um, known crossing sites look like. And this was really the linchpin to the entire study design, just so we could get the right the, the amount of data we needed to do um, analyses. And so, you, of course, you can see this. And you can see that, that animals really do look to use these known crossing sites. They're all waiting to go to this one specific location that they know that they can cross. And so we've used this BACI design, which stands for before, after control, um, um, impediment. Um, and so we have a before period and an after period where what we would expect is that um, for the known crossing sites that their use would be lowered over time um, from the before period to the after period. Because what we do is at the after period we actually lower the bottom wire at that known crossing location so they have to make a decision on, a decision on where to cross. And what we've done is we've uh, raised uh, the bottom wire at these adjacent modification panels. So we expect these modified areas to be higher used um, the longer the, the project is run. So we captured millions and millions of Im images. Again, we had these, these goat bars, we had smooth wire, we had clips um, used by bucks, those fawns. Um, and when it all was said and done, we used a standardized approach to, to record both pronghorn um, and other ungulate and also livestock behavior and interactions with fencing. We ended up processing over 2 million images for this first project. And what we found is that um, basically during the before period, as we would have expected that they're using these historic known uh, crossing sites, but once we lowered the bottom wire there and they couldn't cross there, they had to make a decision. Um, and what they ended up using and habitu habituated towards were uh, both uh, fence panels that have been clipped up or um, had smooth wire associated with them. Interestingly, they did not use these PVC pipes or these goat bars, what, what we affectionately call goat bars. The other interesting thing is, is that through all these um, um, looking at images, we only had one calf um, cross at one of these modified sites. 
um, over a million images assessed down in Montana. Um, and this one calf crossed at this PVC pipe, which we're actually not recommending. Um, so really these fence modifications do a great job at allowing for sustaining wildlife movement while keeping cattle on the pastures that they're supposed to stay in. We also always get asked, what is the appropriate wire height to use um, to sustain wildlife movements? And um, with, some, with some modeling, we show that really at an 18 inch or this 46 centimeter threshold, that's where really where we get a higher propensity of successful movements um, across, across barbed wire fencing. And of course, this was all during the four period. So this doesn't take into account uh, panels that were modified. So really at this 18 inch or 46 centimeter um, height, that's when we really start to see um, an increase in attempts and successful movements. So what we recommend is this pyramid um, of if you can do anything um, for, for mitigating for wildlife movement, mitigate at these known crossing sites. Of course, that's hard to identify and know where they're at. So really what we recommend is using either smooth wire um, to allow for, for wildlife movement or these clips um, every so often uh, so that wildlife can find them and get through. And what we don't recommend are these, these goat bars. We started a, we finished a second um, trial where we looked at the impact of sage grouse markers on ungulate movement, as well as these PVC pipes on top um, and their impacts to ungulate movement. Um, of course, we know that these are effective for, um, for sage grouse not running into fences, but what impact do they have on ungulates? And I can tell I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm gonna start moving through some of these things a little bit quicker. Um, but these are just some results of some uh, before and after data um, at the control locations, the locations that have PVC pipe and have reflectors um, associated with them. And what we show is that it's not statistically significant, but biologically, these um, reflectors and PVC pipes on the top don't have an impact on group success, um, of, of pronghorn successfully crossing fences. Also, as we look at mule deer, um, the, same, the same idea holds true, is that they are not statistically um, um, impacting where, where mule deer are crossing, but biologically, they're not having an influence on how mule, on mule deer successful crossing. But what they are having an influence on is the decision of what type of crossing that they're doing. So what they're, what it is influencing is it's moving animals from jumping over a fence for animals crawling underneath fencing. And we showed with some other um, studies is that um, at a population level, about half the time, mule deer will crawl underneath fencing and about half the time they'll jump over fencing. So what does this mean? Basically, um, PUC pipe and these markers are not impacting the success of ungulate crossing. But what these modifications are doing is they're creating a more visible fence and drawing animals in to them so that they can make fine scale selections and decisions. And importantly, the bottom wire height was in every model for every species. So that parameter is incredibly important for sustaining um, wildlife movement across fences. We are actually in the midst of a third field trial, which is assessing electric fencing and PVC pipe and carabiner use to lower the top wire. And while we're doing that is to, to really get at our deer um, really um, wanting to, are they selecting to crawl under um, fencing or jump over fencing? And as we talked about before, a lot of these processes are multi-scale in nature. And it's the same with wildlife um, interacting with fences. So you have this broad scale choice, which, which is basically uh, a wildlife, uh, an individual um, having to select which fence panel type it's going towards, okay? And then once it's decided which, mental which fence panel type it's gone to, then you have a fine scale interaction. Is it, is it successfully crossing there or is it not? And if it's successfully crossing, how's it doing it? Is it going over or under? And really the whole point here is really to create a multi-species fence design for grassland conservation. We want to create something that's useful for sage grouse, pronghorn, mule deer, white-tailed deer, deer, elk, all those things. So that's really what we're looking to do. 
Okay, now moving into some of them, um, some stuff we've been working on as of late. Um, and I'm going to have to kind of get through this quite quickly. Um, we um, have a paper out um, that, that looks at um, habitat selection during summer and winter range uh, for pronghorn. Um, but I'm going to look at one facet specific, specifically of that, of that study. So there's three objectives. Um, predicting pronghorn summer and winter range across the northern sagebrush steppe, predicting pronghorn seasonal range differences based on if you're a migrant or a resident, and then assess how various fence density scenarios affect the probability of use by pronghorn. So I'm going to look at uh, that, that objective um, specifically. This is just to show the hierarchical nature of all these different models. So we looked at either summer or winter, we looked at both second and third order, we looked at within each of these scales of order if you're a migrant or resident, and then looked within each of these different movement tactics what the impacts of, of fences were um, on, on predicted habitat um, use. So this is just to show that we have some, some really broad scale results. Um, and if anyone is interested in, in any of these results, I'd be um, happy to provide to you. But these show um, summer and winter uh, uh, predicted use by pronghorn um, across the northern sagebrush steppe and have it broken down by if you're a migrant or a resident. Now within there, we have a reduced study area where we actually have uh, uh, fences mapped at a broad scale. So we talked a little bit before about um, the fence density model approach um, for the Highline area of Montana. Our collaborators at Alberta Conservation Association Association also created a fence layer based off of aerial imagery. So we put those two fence layers together and then we assess the impacts of these fences on seasonal range use. And this is just really um, put in there to drive home the point of how many um, times individuals have to deal with fencing across the landscape. In one year, this, uh, this particular individual had to cross fences over 660 times. This particular individual had to cross uh, fences um, close to over 1,100 times. So they truly can be an impediment and they are an influence on where animals uh, select for summer and winter range. And finally, just to draw home the point, uh, drive home the point, if you were to take all that fence that was mapped just in Alberta and you put it side by side, it would circumvent the globe at the equator 6.4 times, almost seven times. So that's how much fencing we have on the landscape. Um, it's just incredible how much is out there. So then we reran our models just for the specific area where we had fence information. And these are the results, again, by uh, season and by uh, movement tactic. And so this is really the take home um, um, graph here. If you just look at the bottom figure, let's look at just winter. Um, I just want to kind of get you oriented. Uh, along the X axis, bin four and five are high quality habitats. Bin one is low quality habitat. And if you're, uh, if you're a black or a red column, that means um, you're either a migrant or resident, but dealing with natural conditions, no fencing on the landscape. Um, and uh, the columns in green and in yellow um, are individuals that are either migrant or resident, but have twice as much, dealing with twice as much fencing on the landscape. So model predictions with complete removal of fences from the landscape, again, these natural conditions, these, these black and these red columns, they predicted an increase in the area of high quality habitat um, by 16 to 38%, these, these bins four and five. And, um, and decreased amount of high quality habitat by one to 11%. Um, so that's these areas right here. Um, and increased low quality habitat by 13 to 21%. So basically, you have more available habitat with less fencing on the landscape. There's less available high quality habitat with more fencing on the landscape. And so effectively, what we've, what we've done is quantify the indirect habitat loss um, from fencing. 
And so these indirect habitat losses can presumably result in population decline. Basically, less habitat generally equates to a decreased ability to support larger numbers of animals. Um, so this is just a theoretical um, graph here, but what we show is that potentially, is, is this what we think is, is happening? Uh, with a higher fence density, we're having decreases in, in pronghorn population. Okay, I'm going to fly through these last two pieces. Um, one to look at a multi-species uh, perspective towards, um, towards good conservation and management. So here we, we're looking at assessing greater sage grouse and pronghorn. And again, at the Northern Sagebrush Steppe, we're at the Northern periphery of both these species range. Um, and there was tracking studies done, um, which again show that these are the largest migratory movements for both of these species. So when we overlap the migratory pathways for both these species, some interesting things um, came out. First off, that they have complementary timing of migration. That really is shown in the spring migration. Um, the median migration dates are between species are within one day of one another for spring migration. Now they're a little bit more drawn off for fall and facultative movement, um, but really it's, uh, it's really quite amazing how close they are um, relative to spring migration. Typically, pronghorn take a little bit longer, and that makes sense because they have to step along the landscape every step of the way. So basically, sage grouse can, can fly over um, impediments to movement. I want to show here, too, that policy is actually making a difference, at least in, in the U.S. Um, here in blue are these areas that are identified as sage grouse priority areas of conservation. These are throughout the sage grouse range. Um, but anyway, these blue areas are, are specific areas for conservation. And then we have in red a connectivity core area. Now there's only two of these across the US and one of them is in northern Montana. Um, and so what we show um, is that there's a lot of movement inside the core areas, um, both the, the, the priority areas of conservation and the connectivity core areas. Um, certainly with, with sage grouse, but also seen with, with pronghorn. And I just kind of want to show what that looks like without those, without those blobs, is that there is good um, overlap between uh, migratory pathways of sage grouse and, and pronghorn. So knowing that tillage, land, um, uh, habitat loss is the primary threat to wildlife across this landscape, what we wanted to do was identify intact parcels vulnerable for cultivation. So what we did was we used this risk assessment um, model that was created by a fellow named Joe Smith, which was based on climate, soils, and topography, and overlap those with um, migratory pathways um, to identify the, the areas that we can um, start working towards conservation. We prioritize parcels based on high value to migration and high risk for cultivation. And that's, this is what that uh, optimal optimization modeling looks like. Um, so right now, um, there is overlap, 65% of the overlapping pathways are conserved, which equates to about 44,000 acres. Um, but if we want 70, 75, 80% of the overlapping, overlapping pathways conserved, we've identified these specific areas that we can do that. And where we look to partner with or collaborate is on private lands that are uncultivated and currently not under easement. So the take home message is that we've done a lot of good work um, with private landowners. They're really uh, having an influence on wildlife management and our goals are within, within reach. And whatever proportion, 70, 75, 80% of uh, that partners are comfortable with, we can start working towards conservation. Finally, just some examples of current projects. Um, we are in the final stages of, of modeling um, and identifying if there is a focal species for the northern sagebrush steppe, looking at um, looking at waterfowl, grassland birds, sage grouse, and pronghorn, along with their migratory movements. Um, so we're looking to to get that paper out over the next several months. We've been working with Montana Department of Transportation, um, collecting their vehicle collision data, um, which you know, obviously it's not the best, but it's a start. And here we've overlaid um, those vehicle collisions along the um, Highway 2 transportation corridor, 
with the fence um, density layer. And what we can see on the top is pronghorn collisions. And you can see that there's much more in areas with low fence density. And for mule deer, there's um, much higher fence collisions in areas with high um, fence density. And so um, that had us, you know, we re-ran our migratory pathways, um, both the spring and fall migratory pathways, and then included fences um, associated with that. And what you can see is that there is um, kind of a flip when you put fences into a use that as one parameter with all the other parameters, it actually flips high quality habitat um, <clears throat> with low quality habitat in some areas. So this area in green um, in the western part of the study area is actually low quality habitat, has high resistance in connectivity modeling. And then when you add fences, it actually becomes um, a little bit higher quality habitat. And so we're, we're thinking that, that fences act as an ecological trap um, during the migratory period. And that what we're seeing is we're having higher vehicle collisions in areas where they really don't prefer. Quickly, um, you may or may not be aware of the Secretary Order 3362 um, down here in the States, but it's to improve um, winter habitat and migration corridors for three species, mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. And because of that, there's just it's been this huge um, increase in, in projects um, specifically for pronghorn. Um, for instance, at, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is, what's, is leading a statewide project starting this January um, with eight study areas with over 460 collars deployed on female pronghorn. These are the eight study areas. Uh, forgive me, I don't have their names, but it's, um, it's across the entire state of Montana, so it's really exciting. And it's exciting, too, that FWP recognizes that some of these populations are seeing alarming declines. And our organization is going to be assisting with on-the-ground implementation, both fence modification and removal. And finally, uh, I just wanted to mention that we are partners with, um, with Pronghorn Crossing, which is a project that was developed in Alberta and was moved over into Saskatchewan and um, National Wildlife Federation, along with partners, has moved it down into northern Montana. It's a smartphone application um, and website mapping tool. And basically, it uses the, the power of citizen science, where, <coughs> excuse me, volunteers partner with scientists to answer real-world questions. And you can see that there's been this huge uptick in the number of, of peer-reviewed papers that have used the power of citizen science. And what you can do is you can do things such as this, where this is the connectivity model that I, that I talked about earlier. And then with the power of citizen science, you can identify um, uh, pronghorn observations where they want to cross or where they are crossing the Trans-Canada Highway. And where you have these overlaps between the two, um, um, you've identified a, a potential hotspot for mitigation. Anyway, these are all of my collaborators. I'm sorry if I've gone over, um, but I appreciate your time. And I really look forward to see if any of you have questions. Um, feel free at any point to reach out to me um, on my email address, which is um, um, jakesa at nwf.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was really awesome. Such a great presentation. I um, I couldn't believe how gory it was at times. Like in the visit, the video there, there was fur flying. It was really, really amazing to see the impact of fences. So thank you so much for sharing all of your, your research and work with us today. Um, thank you to all of our listeners out there. We've had over 50 people tune in to catch the broadcast. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to type it in now. Um, and Andrew, there's a few comments actually. Um, one person named Tracy says she's been happy to, uh, she would have been happy to keep listening for another couple of hours. <laughs> so she said you have great research, great findings, and a really great presentation. So thank you for all three of those. Um, and another listener, Heather, has also written in um, that says it's an excellent presentation, and thank you. Um, I guess before we, we go, uh, just a couple of questions. One listener would like to know um, if there's any plans to do any conservation actions on the Trans-Canada Number 1 Highway in Medicine Hat. Boy, we sure hope to. Um, I think we're building the case. I know partners um, in the province have been working towards that for a number of years. Um, and, you know, we have the science um, related to it. Um, now we're, we're gaining um, 
collecting more data <clears throat> with, <clears throat> sorry, with citizen scientists. And so I think it really opens up the dialogue with the potential agencies, both the, the wildlife agency and the Department of Transportation. So, I mean, all, all, all signs point to that area east of Medicine Hat or the surrounding Medicine Hat area are important towards wildlife movement um, and connectivity of larger impact grasslands. So I think, uh, you know, uh, with public involvement and, and with um, you know, some potential and, and federal dollars, um, some great mitigation can be done in that, in that locale. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named, named Ryan would like to know how easy is it to uh, keep updating these habitat models, especially since the landscape continues to change? Yeah, um, you know, I think you would, it, it all goes back to land cover classifications, um, you know, and so for the Northern Sage Rush step to make that seamless, we had to get data from, um, from Agro Canada as well as some agencies down here in the state. And so that is kind of a limiting factor is to have the seam, seamless land cover um, GIS layer. Um, you know, it, all, all it would take would be some real involved partnerships. But as you know, it's changing um, all the time. Now that's just specific for land cover. I think that there are some tools in the toolbox for looking at specific anthropogenic features. So you can update um, things such as wells, um, roads, um, um, potentially even fences, um, if you have the, the correct um, GIS toolbook, uh, uh, toolbox um, built. Um, and you have to do a lot of, of, of modeling and use a lot of aerial imagery, but it, it, it can be done. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Leonard would like to know, do pronghorns tend to cross barbed wire fences at the midpoint between the two fence posts? Um, you know, that that really depends. We've, uh, we've seen it both ways. Sometimes when there's modifications, um, actually they've crossed at the sides. Um, but, but we typically want to get them across the, the mid part of the panel just to raise that entire fence panel up to 18 inches. But it really depends on how that specific fence was built. Um, ideally, ideally, you want them to cross in the middle point. Thank you. Um, a question from a listener named Aaron. Um, he would like to know if you have any observations regarding impacts of wildlife friendly fences or the fence modifications in pastures with smaller livestock. For example, calving pastures, sheep, goats, etc. cetera. Uh, and specifically he's looking if you have any information about escapes. <laughs> yeah, that is, um, that's a great question. And that's really the next, um, Step because dealing with sheep and goats um, is um, it's a little bit different than, than dealing with cattle and, and horses. Um, and so we haven't started doing any studies on that. I know a lot of our range management agencies, such as um, Bureau of Land Management, um, that's where they want um, the next round of, of trials to go. Um, and so we've thought about that a little bit, but we have not analytically assessed that yet. Okay, thank you for that answer. I think that's all the questions we have today. So thank you again for sharing so much of your detailed research. Um, I know I really, really got a lot out of it and really enjoyed your presentation. And it sounds like our listeners did as well. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thank you listeners for tuning in and have a great day and happy holidays. Thank you again.